At this point, Elmo and Randy decided to sprint ahead to the cabin and get help, leaving the two girls on the beach. They said they would be back within three hours. Be careful. It was such a relief because we finally were at that point where it's, help is actually going to come. We're going to be warm. We're going to be dry by noon. And uh, it was just wonderful to think about. In this boat, it'll take me about an hour to get to the hut. But for Randy and Elmo, it was a whole day slogging against the wind and the waves, paddling all the way. They would also be feeling the effects of 10 days with hardly any food, not to mention the draining effect of the cold and the damp. And remember, they would told the girls they'd be back within three hours. What if they don't come back? What's taking them so long? I figured they'd just run into a lot more trouble than they expected, but that eventually they were going to get it together and come back. And maybe that was a certain um, childhood, just confidence in your daddy, but also denial, because I couldn't I couldn't conceive of losing my dad and my brother. Randy and Elmo turned into Rose Inlet here to face yet another setback. This whole area was covered in ice, too thick to get the boat through, yet too thin to walk on. They abandoned the dinghy at the edge of the ice and carried on on frostbitten feet, using the last of their strength. It's hard to imagine now how desperate things must have been. This is just 40 feet from the hut, but when Elmo and Randy came here, this was deep in snow. They struggled up the slope, fully expecting to find help and someone to go back to the two girls before nightfall. Things in here look pretty much the same as they would have back then. When they got here, they hoped there would be people because they knew that there were trappers who spent the whole winter out here. But unfortunately, the trap lines had been closed at the end of the season just a few days earlier, and it was deserted. But what they did find was this, an old CB radio. To get it working, they connected it up to a car battery, and at last, they were able to call for rescue. Mady, Mady, this is Rose Inlet calling any station. Come in, please. But the cabin was in a notorious radio dead spot, and snow had covered the aerial. Their plan had failed, and they were too frostbitten and weak to leave the hut. All they could do was rebuild their strength to the point where they could at least attempt a rescue. Cindy and Gina were left to fend for themselves. And I've had people say, oh, you must have some real issues with um, abandonment and things like that. I never once felt abandoned, and after I found I knew what had happened, I never once felt like they weren't doing everything they could to get back to us. They could barely walk. They knew it was suicide to go back out. Here you go, Randy. Thanks. For anyone to say that they were in a better position than Cindy and I were in, I think they're mistaken because the psychological aspect of it was so much worse for them. After one particularly cold night, Elmo and Randy became convinced the girls must have died. They had to deal with death. And Cindy and I were not dealing with death in our minds. We were dealing with life. Can you imagine chocolate cake when we get back? Mm, I know what I'm going to have. I'm going to have a big roast beef dinner with mashed potatoes. And vegetables. It was a struggle for food, and it was a struggle to keep warm. But I think the reason the two of us stayed alive all that time was that we had we, I say we, I had complete faith that they would come back. We're just going to have a big feast, OK? Mm -hmm. Dad can pay for everything. <laughs> At one point, I had this vivid, vivid dream. And my dad and my brother were standing there by this fire. And I said, what's going on? Where are you? You said you were going to come back. What is it? And he just looked at me. He said, just take one day at a time, babe. It wasn't until the morning of the 12th day at the hut that the tide started to turn for them. By then, the snow had melted sufficiently that Elmo could come down here and search amongst the remains of this old cannery. He was amazed to find a fiberglass boat. It needed patching up, 
but the next day it was ready for the trip back to Keg Point. If we would have known the first day that my dad left us on the beach, that it wasn't going to be a matter of a few hours, but it, it, would, it would be 13 days, I think that would have made a di big difference. I don't think I, th I don't think I could have convinced myself that we would stay alive that long with next to nothing. But then again, life is life, and as long as you're living, you just keep on living. You do things to live. If you start thinking about death, death is there. This is where they must have come ashore. You can imagine how they were feeling. They left the girls here 13 days before, and they were convinced they'd both be dead. Elmo made Randy wait down here by the shore while he went ahead to see what he could find. Gina? I heard my dad's voice. Dad? Dad! Oh, thank God! I was so excited and I was so happy and I said, I knew you were going to come back. I knew it. I knew it. And he, he said, you're alive. And, and again, it was like, well, of course. We couldn't imagine what else we would be. The crew was back together, and there was our leader, and uh, it was wonderful. They reached the hut to find that the owners had returned while Randy and Elmer had been away. They were rescued soon after by a Coast Guard helicopter. Their survival in a frozen wilderness defied medical science. We had the Coast Guard, the search and rescue, the doctors coming in and, and shaking their heads. They said, that just doesn't happen, but it does. And I think we tend to focus, put a lot of focus on what, what the limits are instead of thinking, we don't know what the limits are. Physically, Elmo Wartman came out of the ordeal worst, frostbite claiming half of one foot and all the toes on the other. Despite having lived for a month without food and in freezing conditions, both Cindy and Gina Wartman made full recoveries. But there's more to surviving than just being rescued. Many survivors have to overcome deep-seated psychological trauma long after the original ordeal is over. For a long time, I carried around guilt, thinking that I really didn't do enough. I didn't try hard enough. I didn't paddle hard enough or long enough. Uh, and it's taken 20 years to realize that at 12, you can only do so much. And I realized that I was forgiving so much and so many other people. And then I could look back and see that I hadn't forgiven the 12-year-old that I was. And realizing that that's really a long time to, to hold a grudge, especially against a 12-year-old. Even now, at the end of my journey, sitting near to the beach where Cindy and Gina spent 13 long days, it's hard to imagine the amount of mental toughness they needed to survive here. I've seen this area at its best with long summer days, where they had the long, cold, bitter nights of winter. And where they faced starvation, I've been able to find plenty of food, like the salmon that I'm cooking in a traditional way. But just because their ordeal occurred in remote wilderness, don't think that these skills don't apply to you. We all of us, at some point in our lives, find events spiraling out of control. At those times, it's not what you know that counts, but how you apply it. Just as I said at the beginning of the program, you have to make your psychology work for you.